Well, last week in my sermon, I mentioned about a movie. And we talked a little bit briefly about the the narrative story of how to train your dragon. Well, after the service was over for contemporary service later on that morning, I got home, and as I always am, I'm hungry. You know, I'm ready for lunch at that point, as many of us probably are. But I was hungry for something specific. I was hungry for popcorn after talking about that movie. And not just any popcorn, but it had to be the extra butter flavor because there's nothing better than a piece of popcorn with that delicious buttery, you know, the kind that you get your fingers off the popcorn and you can just feel the butter on it, you know what I'm talking about? You know, I love a good bag of popcorn when I watch a movie. And then I got to thinking about those kernels in that bag and as we're talking about courage and trying to find courage within us, And it made me realize that there's something peculiar about popcorn. Because it starts out as those little kernels. And and nobody likes a kernel of popcorn unpopped. It's just not enjoyable to eat. But under the right conditions, when it's put through that pressure of heat in the microwave, something changes. Something inside of that kernel is activated and it pops. And suddenly we've got this delicious popcorn that we do enjoy. And as I'm thinking about courage and I'm, I'm reflecting on my hunger for popcorn, I start to realize that's, that's really what we're getting at here with this sermon series. Sometimes we're under pressure. And that's when God is, is trying to change us. God is trying to transform us, to activate that spirit's power within us to become something tasty to the world, to be that salt in the world. And the most amazing thing about popcorn, it can't go back. You can't unpop a popcorn kernel. When God gives us courage to do amazing, mighty things, he doesn't want us to go back. My hope and prayer through this this sermon series is that as we develop the, the desire to see that godly courage within us, we're like that popcorn kernel that's popped that doesn't ever go back. That doesn't ever turn around and say, okay, I did what I needed to do, now I'm going back to my old ways. Because that's not what God is all about. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we do indeed enjoy our popcorn with the movies. God, it's, it's, it's powerful to be reminded, even in the simplest of snacks, though, that you can still speak to us. God, help us be like a popcorn kernel. Help us be the the kernel that pops, that the world looks at and says, I want some of that too. God, help us to have courage and help us to be prepared, even in those tough times of pressure and, and uncertainty, to know that that's when you do your best work. Amen. Well, if you haven't been with us for the past two weeks, I encourage you to check out our website where you can find... I thought there was another verse I forgot about for a second there. (laughs) As I said, if you haven't been with us the past couple of weeks, I would definitely encourage you to look on our website where you can find the previous four-week sermons as well as a link to our YouTube page where you can catch up with any other sermons uh, that you may have missed. But uh, at least the past two weeks' worth of sermons will help put into perspective everything we've been talking about today and up until this point. We've been journeying together through, uh, with the help of the book, Take Heart, Finding Courage in the Age of Unbelief by Matt Chandler. And we're beginning to see this slowly emerging trend around us as the church begins to kind of lose its place at the head of the cultural table, so to speak. Our first week, we started out by taking a look at the approach that we've typically had to culture around us that is couched in fear and anxiety uh, and exasperation at some level as we grasp Uh, kind of to try to save what scraps we have left with what we see as our our faith. Uh, But Matt Chandler is is kind of hoping to show that we don't need to react that way, that we can have courage and faith that God is still going to succeed in what he has already told us he would do. Last week we began to look where we find the beginning of courage, 
And we started trying to, to accomplish this impossible task of understanding just how big God really is. He has these unlimited resources and riches beyond our wildest dreams. And a wisdom that's not really based on conjecture and guesstimates, but in truth, from a God who is transcending even time itself. So what we found is, as we start to understand that, our fear really shouldn't rule the day and guide our actions, because we serve a God who is bigger in all different ways. A.W. Tozer, a brilliant theologian, once wrote in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing to us. He expresses further in that, that our image of God is ultimately how we move forward as Christians. It's what we move toward in our living and our thinking and interacting with the world around us. He goes on to say, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Now I think Tozer was on to something with that insight. How we think of God, the things we focus on about God's character, is what drives everything we do in life, how we interact with everything around us, our finances, our marriages, our relationships to others, our work, our leisure, parenting, etc., etc., so on and so on. If when we think about God, we imagine his graciousness, his kindness, his love and forgiveness, then we will likely find that in our relationships and interactions, we are couched in grace. We are moving to give people the benefit of the doubt in every situation. And we tend to be more generous. However, if all we think about when we talk about God is his anger and his wrath and his judgment and scorn for sin, if that's the only thing we ever focus our attention on, we might find ourselves attempting to live in this world that is imperfect as perfectionists who are constantly let down by ourselves and others, by situations that arise, and leave us constantly frustrated. Our understanding of who God is is critical and cannot be overstated. Even as God can't be fully comprehended in our finite minds, we have to seek to understand the revelation of who God is from His Word. That's one of the best blessings that I think we have as Christians is God's word because it reveals God to us. We can't fully understand him, but we can get a little bit closer to him each time we open them up. Now, as my friend Matt Chandler points out in his book, uh, there's an attribute of God that's sort of overlooked pretty often, though. It's sorely missed in churches. And some people find it so repugnant that they don't even touch it because they can't understand it. Some have found it strange and absurd. Others have found it too difficult to even accept that this is real. And some have kind of just missed the point of it entirely. And that point is this. Our God is a warrior. This attribute of God has sort of vanished from churches today, from many who worship him. And that's really caused a bit of a problem, I think, for some churches that have left people not fully com comprehending God in full as best they can. See, churches that have gone to ignore this idea of God as a warrior have sort of arrived at this position where they kind of have a Tinkerbell Jesus, as Chandler calls it. It's this kind of Jesus who carries with him this, this bag of magic powder so he can sprinkle them with blessings and remind them how wonderful they are and how they can do nothing wrong nor do anything to ever make him upset. That's not necessarily the entire story of the Jesus I read in the Gospels. Now, it's certainly important that we must point out God is indeed full of grace, mercy, patience, and kindness, and we can't neglect or ignore that. 
they are essential to understanding the good news of the gospel, that God loves us and sends Jesus to be that sacrifice for us. But in that, I also believe we have to know that God is a warrior to fully understand the gospels as well. Because it's God fighting for our very souls in those moments. If you go back to Exodus 15.3, this is probably the best place to start. There's no frills about this. Exodus 15.3 says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. It doesn't get much clearer than that. In other words, the God we serve, the great I Am, is a warrior who is fighting for us, who is at war over things for us. And in light of that, that's how we begin to see that our stories individually as people, our story as the church of Greencastle, our story as the church of Jesus Christ all around the world is really caught up in a greater story of a God who is fighting a war on our behalf. And this, this war has been playing out since the beginning of time itself. The war began all the way back in the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, that idyllic place that God had created perfect. It was good. Things were right. And then Satan shows up. Adam and Eve were duped by Satan into thinking that God was somehow preventing them from something better by restricting them from that forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The minute that they took those bites of that fruit, war was declared. And the war over sin had begun. Two men by the name of Tremper Longman III and Daniel G. Reed wrote a book called God is a Warrior. And in it, they describe this warrior God who is working through what they consider the five stages of God's war. And as you might expect, we're still in the middle of those five stages to some degree. Even as the war itself has ultimately already been won, we are still in the midst of that. So Longman and Reed go on to describe these five stages, and the first one is the stage where God is fighting for Israel. The Hebrews are at this point slaves in Egypt. They've been taken into submission by the Egyptian rulers, and they're crying out in their suffering, God, deliver us from this. And Yahweh shows up, and he frees them. And this is where I, I think I've never heard this before, and it, it, it sort of struck me as, as an interesting way to perceive this. But Yahweh shows up and wars against not just Egypt, but the false gods of Egypt through the plagues. Worship the Nile, God turns it to blood. Worship the cattle, God kills the livestock. Worship a god of the crops, God sends locusts to devour them. Worship the sun god Ra, God turns the sky dark. And his people go free. Beyond that, he helps them eventually conquer and settle in this promised land of Cana. Now, for some, this is where God as a warrior becomes a very problematic image. And it's caused a lot of people to struggle with how can we worship a God who is so violent? Well, imagine this conquest in all its gory details without any context, and we might have trouble fully comprehending what's going on here. If we saw a 20-something-year-old running down a beach murdering people, we might think he's a maniac. But what if that 20-year-old running down the beach was running down the beach in Normandy on June 6, 1944, D-Day? And this young man was not just any random young man, but an allied soldier fighting against Nazi Germany. Suddenly, he's not a murderous maniac. He's a hero, a soldier, and a liberator. You see, context sets us up to understand what God is doing in those moments in history that we don't fully understand culturally. And that's important. That's how God is operating at this stage. He is a liberator. The Canaanites were given over 400 years to repent. They had been sacrificing babies to idols. And they had been systematically killing off the elderly and those with any deformity because they held less value to their society. These were monsters. 
So as we move on, we start to begin to see another stage of the war come about. Suddenly, it's not God fighting for Israel, but it's God warring against Israel. Because they have refused to honor him, his commandments, his law. It's been lost upon them. They've turned their back on God. They've begun worshiping other idols and false gods. That's a problem. We can't have that. So in judgment for these sins and their, their failure to love their neighbor, to love God, worshiping idols, selfishly hoarding wealth for themselves, neglecting the poor and the vulnerable among them, God sends these prophets to call them out. And eventually, when they don't listen to the prophets, exile comes about. God is going to break them down one way or another until they see the error of their ways in this war. Eventually, God's people find themselves scattered, just as the prophet Jeremiah had declared would happen. Enter stage three. It's this period of waiting. It's silence from God. Centuries of silence from God. I, I sometimes struggle when I go a whole week without spending time hearing from God. I can't imagine centuries where God is quiet. God's people are waiting. They're eagerly desiring God to show up. This, this warrior God who for many years fought for them, they want him to show up. They, they're waiting on this Messiah the one who would come and restore God's kingdom and God's people to their rightful place. The people are remembering back to what is now our Old Testament. They remember this warrior God who showed up in the nick of time to save them. And they want to believe that God will fight for them once again. Then along it comes, stage four. The warrior God emerges. And we find this little baby Jesus in a manger. The Son of God has taken on human flesh to fight sin and death, to defeat the old serpent from the garden, and to rescue all of us from the consequences of that fall. The problem is this is not the warfare that they had come to expect from God. It's not violent or destructive. It isn't about power or conquest of Rome at least not through the normal means that they were thinking it would. It's about humility and meekness and love. It's taking the Roman tool that was meant to be the most humiliating, most painful way to die and flipping it over on its head. It's through the cross. That's how Jesus wins the war. And as Satan begins to try to accuse us daily sometimes of being guilty because of our sin, now we have that cross that Jesus used as a weapon itself to take Satan's greatest weapon and render it null and void. While the Satan tries to maybe scrap for us, tries to turn us around, to turn us away from God, to cause us to feel that guilt and that weight once again, we know it's already been defeated. Now, it's in the aftermath of this stage where we are still writing our stories as part of God's people. We find them playing out in this larger narrative that God is still working out around us. And we get to join in the victory songs of what Christ has done for us and for all of creation. When we get together for worship like we are right now, we're not only bringing ourselves before God to offer him whatever we have to bring, but the best part, when we think about God as a warrior, we're rattling Satan's cage real bad right now. Because he knows, he's being reminded now that he's already lost. And not only that, we celebrate that coming day I and mean, that fifth and final stage that those two gentlemen talk about of God's cosmic war will finally arrive. Jesus will return. We heard that read today. He will return once again. And he's going to put everything right. Everything's going to go back to the way it should be. That is what we know 
to be true. And it helps bolster our courage when we begin to realize that even as Satan tries to tempt us to, to turn to fear and anxiety and allow that to rule the day, we have the knowledge that we don't need to be afraid. Because no matter what happens in the end, we know who wins. I had a professor in college who uh, would always pose the question in some of his classes, if you could sum up the book of Revelation in two words, what would they be? Now, being, being young and smart and thinking I knew how to be really funny, I would always simply say the end. But it's not the end. It's just the beginning of the next part of God's cosmic life together. He, he would always say, no, there's two words that you need to know about Revelation. Jesus wins. Our God is a warrior who's already won the war and will finish up winning on that final day. Now, there's some courage in that, isn't there? As God's people, we, we know God fights for us. God has already fought for us, is still fighting for us, and will finish wrapping up fighting for us on that final day. There's some courage to that, isn't there? Our story is one of a God who fights for us. Our story is one of a God who has triumphed over our toughest foes. Our story is one that we know is ultimately leading us to that culmination of God's redemptive work. We don't stand back and wring our hands pridefully at it, nor do we stand back and keep gazing at our navels or keep our heads buried in the sand about it either. We take it out to the world to declare victory. It is everything about us, our thoughts, our words, our actions, everything about us, as we live day to day to day until we get to the day. Amen.